the underlying scientific article. So if people would like to see more details, uh, then please uh, check this article. I will come to that uh, a little bit later. So actually, uh, the, the picture that you see here on the first slide pretty much shows what this whole story will be about. The wolf is seeing all kinds of uh, opportunities in human-dominated landscapes, and it often brings him, unfortunately, in conflict with us. And this talk will be a bit, a bit about uh, what can we do about uh, preventing these kind of conflicts. Actually, since a long time ago, uh, humans and large carnivores have been living at odds with each other. Uh, these relationships, they go back to uh, prehistoric times, so very, very long time. And actually, we've always been regarding them as competitors or threats to our safety. And as a result, we have been uh, uh, killing them very often. And if you look at the impact that this ha has had on large carnivores, it's actually quite dramatic. This is a very nice publication from Lali, Berg and Ripple, Ripple, published in Bioscience, that showed what happened in North America with all the large carnivores that they have there after the uh, European settlers uh, arrived on, on the North American continent. And actually, you see a lot of, a lot of red on these maps, and that shows all range contractions. So most of these large carnivores really retracted to remote areas uh, far away from humans. And this is pretty much uh, a global picture. Uh, actually, the, the continuous persecu uh, persecution of large carnivores has led to a worldwide loss of apex predators. And apex, I don't know if everybody is uh, uh, familiar with the term, apex means the predator that is on top of the food chain. And if you look at this map taken from a Ripple published in Science, then you can see especially, I don't know if you can see my pointer, I hope so, uh, the gray areas here in Europe and North America indicate that there is actually no large carnivore left, although they used to occur there. And you have only some places left uh, across the globe where you still have rich multi-species uh, large carnivore communities, for example here in Southeast Asia or some parts in uh, Central Africa. And together with the loss of these species, we also lost their ecosystem impact, and that may be actually much more dramatic than, uh, than we think. Uh, just a few examples of scientific evidence for seven uh, large carnivore species for which they have good evidence that uh, the, the loss of these species really resulted in changes in the ecosystem. What you can see in this graph is that some of these species, uh, some species increased in abundance after these large carnivores uh, disappeared. Uh, and that's often the main prey species that are affected by these, uh, directly affected by predation. And as a result, you see also all kinds of other species, indicated here in blue, uh, declining. Actually, the main thing that I would like to demonstrate is, with this image is that all kinds of things are changing. Some species are increasing and others are decreasing, mainly as a result of all the infections uh, that result from the loss of large carnivores. And you have an, uh, one sentence in this paper, which is, I think, quite an, uh, an important one for us. The maintenance or recovery of ecologically effective densities of large carnivores is an important tool for maintaining the structure and function of diverse ecosystems. So actually they stress the importance of recovering these large carnivores to get at least some of their ecosystem uh, impacts uh, back. And when specifically when it comes to wolves, there's also a lot of scientific evidence that shows that wolves also can uh, create such an ecosystem impacts. This is from the same paper, paper from Ripple in Science, and it shows all the interactions that they attribute or that they link to the comeback of wolves in the Yellowstone National Park. In Yellowstone, also wolves were absent for, uh, for, for uh, what is it, 70, 80 years. They were reintroduced and then they observed all kinds of changes in the ecosystem, which they link to uh, the comeback of wolves. And we often think about the impacts that they have on their prey species. Uh, and then you can think about density mediated effects. So they affect the numbers of these prey species by, uh, by predating them. But also very important are these behaviorally mediated effects. By, uh, by changing the behavior, uh, they, oh, wait, sorry, something goes wrong here. By, by changing the behavior, okay, it's not technical, I think it doesn't matter. Oh, by changing the behavior, they also create these ecosystem impacts. And actually by uh, both the density mediated effect and the behavior mediated effects, you have uh, indirect effects on woody plant species, and therefore all kinds of species which are correct, connected to these habitats, they are also impacted. Well, next to the effects on prey species, they also affect mesocarnivores, or smaller carnivore species, and that in that way indirectly the prey species which are regulated by the mesocarnivores. So actually a variety of, of effects for which they found evidence. There's also 
scientific debate which uh, factors really occur, but I think it is uh, quite clear that ecosystem impacts, impacts do exist. Well, if you think about this context, uh, uh, the comeback of large carnivores, uh, especially that we observe nowadays in Europe, is very interesting if you think about the ecosystem impacts that we have lost uh, and potentially they could return to, to, to some extent. So in my eyes, we should actually cherish what we observe nowadays in Europe, that the large carnivores that we have, wolverine, European lynx, brown bear and wolves, are all expanding their ranges and also their population uh, densities are increasing. These light orange colors indicate actually the ranges where they are expanding, so they are occurring in larger areas. And the wolf is a species which is actually very um, successful in recolonizing Europe. Indicated here in these uh, red lines is the, the, the areas where wolves always occurred, so where they were not uh, exterminated. And from these areas, so that the Central Europe, the Balkan region and Italy, they have been recolonizing large parts of Europe. And just to give you some numbers, if you look at uh, <coughs> Western Poland, in a period of about uh, 11 years, more than 30 packs of wolves established there, more than 140 individual wolves. And these numbers are already now outdated. This is based on the paper of uh, Sabine Novak and Robert Mislajek. And also in Germany, the first reproduction of wolves occurred in the year 2000. And nowadays they have about 59 packs and almost 500 wolves living in Germany. And even in crazy countries where I come from myself, the Netherlands, and I call it crazy because the human density is really very high. It belongs to one of the most uh, densely populated areas in Europe and even across uh, the globe. Even there, wolves managed to establish uh, last year in 2020, the first uh, pair established and reproduced. So they have now one pack there and one pair, about 10 wolves living in this, uh, in this country. And of course, the ecosystem impacts that uh, wolves can exert in such a human dominated systems can be very different from what is observed in, for example, Yellowstone, uh, very undisturbed wilderness areas. And in this paper, uh, we reviewed actually how humans can influence uh, all kinds of processes that happen in these, uh, in these uh, trophic cascades. So if you think about the impact that a wolf can have on its prey species and potentially on the vegetation, in European landscapes, you always have to take into account that the human is somewhere in the middle. We, we did not place it on the top of the food chain, we placed it in the middle because actually we affect really every trophic layer. It doesn't mean that ecosystem impacts of wolves uh, do not occur in European landscapes, but we should always take into account that they can be strongly modified by humans. So we should be a little bit careful with uh, the impacts that we expect from large carnivores in these human dominated uh, systems in Europe, without really taking into account all the interactions that humans uh, create, so we can strongly modify their impact. But anyway, if you look at European landscapes, these ecosystem impacts of uh, wolves, they have been uh, recorded. I will show you some examples from the Białowieża forest, mainly of the, that's all studies from the Memel Research Institute. Uh, also examples exist from other countries, but uh, I would like to show you these, uh, these examples because I'm most familiar with them. <clears throat> well, first of all, there's clear evidence for density mediated effects. So the wolf is predating its main prey species, red deer, and in that way it has an effect on the growth rate of, of, uh, of the deer population. Publication from Jędrzejewski, in, published in Ecology, shows it very nicely. If you imagine the Białowieża forest without wolves, then the deer population would grow much faster. And now, in the presence of wolves, this growth rate is being uh, reduced. 32 to 40 cent percent reduction in the deer population growth rate. Well, our own studies, uh, they show that uh, also there's evidence for behaviorally mediated effects. So based on very intensive camera trap studies that we conducted in the Białowieża forest, and this is the a map of the entire Białowieża forest, the national park here, the, uh, the part managed by state forest uh, on the, uh, is the rest of the map. And what this map indicates is the darker the color, the higher the encounter rate of wolves. So you can really indicate in the Białowieża landscape some parts which are more intensively being used by wolves, which is mainly related to where they reproduce. And if you look at how this affects, of how this seems to affect the behavior of uh, red deer, the main prey species, these patterns are pretty much opposite. Locations with a high encounter rate of wolves seem to be avoided by red deer. So these, these studies, they suggest that really on a landscape scale, the 
the, the presence of wolves really makes a difference and changes on a landscape scale uh, pattern of space use of their main prey species. Well, I will not go too much into detail because I want to uh, go to, uh, to more the conflict uh, part. But anyway, I will show you that we found in several publications evidence for these behavioral effects of wolf on deer, both on a landscape scale and also on the on fine scale. And we, we found in another set of publications that these changes in behavior really uh, has consequences for patterns of uh, browsing intensity of deer on trees and also patterns of uh, uh, regeneration. So this freeway interaction that the wolf is influencing the deer, both in numbers and behavior, has definitely consequences for patterns of tree regeneration. So these, these things, they, they do occur. And in a recent publication, we also showed that effects on mesocarnivores uh, have been observed in the Bioviesia forest, a paper led by Tom Disserens. Uh, what, we what we found is that uh, in locations in the forest where you have a high encounter rate of wolves, badgers are much less likely to use their burrows, so their sets, and badgers prefer to be more intensively using those sets which are uh, in the more safe parts of the forest where they have a lower encounter rate, uh, rate of wolves. So is it worth to protect wolves? If you look at uh, the global uh, decline of large carnivores and the loss of their ecosystem impacts and the uh, evidence that we have that these, imp that these impacts really can return to some extent, it's definitely worth to protect wolves, I would say. Scientifically, there are very good reasons to welcome the comeback of wolves. But I think we should also not forget that the wolf can be, uh, can be seen as a sinner. Uh, uh, it is also an, uh, a highly conflict prone species. So it uh, often results in conflicts once it shows up in human dominated landscapes. So just to give you an idea of the most common perceived uh, conflicts, uh, livestock predation is a very common, uh, common thing actually everywhere where wolves show up. It's the first thing often that happens that uh, it starts attacking also uh, livestock, especially when farmers are not prepared for their comeback. And to give you an idea of the extent of this problem, uh, 20, 21,000 sheep have been compensated in the European Union, which is and which are mainly attributed to the uh, predation by wolves. And there are huge or very large differences between different countries or different regions. But there's definitely some hotspots of this issue of this conflict in France, Portugal, Greece, Croatia and Italy, which is also to a large extent related to how they are uh, keeping their livestock, as you see on the picture. Another perceived uh, problem is uh, competition with, uh, with hunters. Wolves often like the same species that we like as, uh, as hunters. So think about moose, think about red deer. And also during hunting, uh, hunting dogs are uh, occasionally being killed by, by, by wolves. And especially in Scandinavia, this is quite, uh, quite an issue. It's also related to how they are hunting there. They use moose dogs, which are individually released in the forest to search for moose. If these dogs encounter a wolf pack, then often uh, it results in a bad ending for, for the dog. And to give you an idea of these number, of the, of the numbers, in Finland, I found these numbers, 20 to 31 hunting dogs being killed over a three year period. There's also concerns about uh, public safety. And despite the fact that wolf attacks are actually very rare, uh, they do occur. There's a nice review of all the documented attacks of wolves on humans by uh, John Dinell. And the last 50 years, uh, they showed that there are 21 documented non-rabid attacks. So that means uh, wolves that did not have rabies that were involved in attacks on humans, so bite incidents. Also, it included four lethal cases. So it's very rare, but uh, it does occur. And I think everybody in Poland will remember also that these bite incidents also occurred in Poland. Uh, two years ago in the Piazza and Lubuskie. But I think we always have to take into account, especially with these cases in Poland, uh, that there was a more of an, uh, a story uh, connected to it, because these wolves seem to be uh, habituated to humans. So they were used to humans, which resulted in uh, these accidents. But what we often ignore, let's go back one, uh, one step. Th this is often what we think, that the wolf is a danger for us. But I think we should not ignore that scientific evidence shows that this is actually what normally happens. Wolves are running away from us and are escaping from everything that is connected to humans. Uh, there's a recent, uh, of a relatively recent, nice uh, meta-analysis by uh, Zatornil in biological conservation that showed again that actually everywhere where you look in North America or in Europe, the main factor that determines patterns of space use, activity patterns, or breeding site selection is the presence of humans. 
So it is, uh, so they are avoiding us still. But despite this fact, and this is a compilation that I made for a publication that we're working on, this is also what we observe uh, everywhere in Europe, uh, a higher incidence of close wolf human uh, encounters. You have, for example, uh, very interesting YouTube movies where you see a wolf walking in the middle of a, a small city in the Netherlands. In Germany, you have also such uh, uh, videos or photos. Also in Poland, this occurs. And especially this is a beautiful uh, video. Uh, maybe you can just uh, see this bit of a, a foggy uh, picture, but you see a wolf walking here in the middle of the street. And a Dutch guy on the bike is making a nice circle around the wolf to avoid bumping into it. Well, this, of course, gives a lot of attention. It, it, it attracts a lot of attention in media, and it also raises a lot of questions of what's really going on. There is uh, there is ideas that this is related to uh, the fact that the wolves are losing their fear for humans, and that's uh, I think there's at the moment very little evidence for it, but you, we can discuss it in the end. It could also simply be the result of an increasing number of wolves in human-dominated areas. So then the encounter rate of wolves and humans. Uh, will also necessarily increase. Well, despite the, the, the return of wolves actually everywhere results in strong emotions. Uh, think about uh, farmers that lose their livestock to uh, incidents of predation. Maybe these numbers might be not that, that high, but it is still a very emotional event. I can understand it myself as an animal breeder that losing animals to, your, uh, to a predator is really a very uh, sensitive. So the comeback of wolves in many countries results in often large protests. For example, here in France, all the farmers were uh, strongly protesting against the comeback of wolves. You have also organizations in, uh, uh, that, is, uh, that are actually aiming to prevent the comeback of wolves to uh, Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, or Luxembourg. And the numbers that are presented, uh, about, uh, that are presented about these conflicts, you can all put in, into perspectives. You could say, when it comes to hunting dogs, there is just a few hunting dogs that are being killed. No problem. Not you pay for the, you pay for the hunting dog farmer. Of the, the hunters are happy again. When you think about the livestock that is being killed by wolves, it's sometimes even smaller than the the livestock killed by dogs. And if you think about public safety, uh, there is more much more people being killed by cars than by wolves. But I think it is a big mistake to downgrade these numbers. And I think you really have to take these emotions very serious. And why is that? That it's mainly because these anti-wolf sentiments will have a very big impact on support for wolf conservation. So I would say uh, don't down downgrade it and really take it seriously. And another thing is that these emotions, they uh, blur an objective view. If you are filled with emotions, you cannot objectively look at what are the options available to, uh, to prevent these conflicts, or to solve these conflicts. And that's, that was actually the starting point for, for this publication, keep the wolf from the door. What we did is we compared different management scenarios. And the idea of the aim that we had was to come up with an objective uh, science-based discussion on possible management approaches. And then we used uh, existing knowledge that exists in Europe, in countries where they have already a much more long-term long experience with dealing with large carnivores, but also from other parts of the globe. Because this is what we should not forget. We don't need to reinvent the wheel in, in Europe. It is actually nothing specific what is happening. If you look across the globe, there's many areas where people have found ways how to live together with large carnivores, to coexist with them and to share landscapes. And often they are dealing with much more dangerous large carnivores uh, than the wolves that we have. So I think we should much better profit from the knowledge that exists already. And of course, if you talk about management scenarios, you should not forget the, uh, you should always put it in the context of the legal uh, status of wolves in Europe. And therefore we had uh, this guy on board as a co-author, Ari Trauborst, an associate professor uh, specialized in environmental uh, law, specialized, uh, specialized in large carnivores. Uh, and he helped us with this. Well, in general, if you look on the map, there's, uh, there's a diversity of uh, different legal status of wolves in, uh, in Europe. In general, uh, the more uh, strict protective regime supply. You see a lot of dark green on the map, and that is related to uh, habitat, the habitats directives. In most countries where the wolf is now uh, returning, it is listed as an Annex 4 species, which means that killing, capturing, or disturbing it is uh, prohibited. It doesn't mean that you can never do it. There's definitely exceptions possible, but you need to, uh, you need to meet three important criteria. 
And that is, first of all, that should be very compelling societal reasons to, uh, to kill a wolf. Uh, that, can, that can also include uh, public uh, health or safety issues. You should check for alternatives. So there should be no alternatives available uh, for, uh, for killing, uh, killing a wolf. Uh, and it should also not have effects on the favorable conservation status of the species. Well, start with this one, population control. So killing uh, sh shooting wolves. It's often the first option that we think about, and definitely in several places, this is also a legal uh, uh, legal management tool to, uh, to, to, to solve conflicts. For example, in the United States, in several states outside the national parks, they do this. Also in Norway, this happens in Sweden and Finland as the two European member states. It also occurs, but don't forget that there is a lot of legal controversies, whether this is really in accordance with European law or not. And despite the fact that uh, maybe many countries don't kill them, uh, legally, there are still in, in, in several regions a significant amount of uh, illegal uh, killing, so poaching. Uh, these estimates are uh, often very difficult estimates, but if you look at these numbers, they can be quite significant and they can really have an impact on uh, the population growth rate, as some studies suggest. But actually, the main issue uh, that is connected to uh, shooting wolves is uh, that they often create source sink dynamics that can lead to completely counterintuitive effects. And I made this beautiful drawing myself to explain very easily what is actually what, what the idea is. If you imagine a large area where wolves are occurring, and let's say that you want to solve some conflicts and you start shooting them and you create some places where wolves are being removed. The main thing that you uh, that directly happens, and that is not nothing specific to wolves, but it actually it happens with all species that you start hunting, most species, you create vacancies uh, with no wolves, so uh, with a low competition and also often a high food availability. So what you do is you start attracting wolves from the surrounding area where you do not hunt them. And if you think about this area as, in a, as a country, uh, often you also attract uh, wolves from your neighboring country and think about the legal landscape in Europe, where in most countries, the wolf is legally protected. This may often uh, happen. And another thing is, if you think about the wolves that you attract, often you attract young dispersing individuals. And it, it turns out that these, these individuals are much more likely to be involved in livestock uh, predation because they operate by themselves and they do not have a pack that, they can, uh, that can help them during hunting. But well, an illustration of the sourcing dynamics is, uh, is provided by this paper from Alaska, from Schmidt. Uh, this is not our, our colleague from the Memo Research Institute, but it's in a Canadian version. Actually, they did very intensive studies here uh, on wolf population dynamics for over 22 years in the Yukon Charlie Rivers National Reserve Preserve. And the whole idea is that they have one large uh, preserve where they do not hunt, and it is surrounded by areas where they have strict population control. And it is Figure you can see actually what happens if you look at the mean natality rate, so how much wolves are being born inside this reserve during periods of population control outside, the natality rate increases very strongly. So it shows that this, the, the, this, this national park becomes a source population, so it starts to provide more wolves to the surrounding area once you start hunting outside. Another example that culling is often not really solving the problem is provided by uh, an 11 year study from uh, Slovenia. There they also experienced a high uh, livestock depredation. And as a result, they decided to do a nationwide culling of wolves, about five wolves per year they shot and it comprised almost 25% of the animal population. So quite a significant uh, proportion. And if you look at the figure, the black line indicates the number of wolves that they shot and the gray bars indicate the uh, amount of livestock predation. Well, in general, since the start of uh, culling, so that's in 1999, they did not really see or observe a consistent decrease, uh, de decrease in livestock predation. It actually first increased, there was a dip, and afterwards they recorded really very high incidence of livestock predation. So they did not find any correlation between the number of wolves that they shot and the the, uh, the livestock predation that you observed the subsequent year. And even if you look at the most extreme events, for example, in 2006, when uh, there was an, uh, the highest number of wolves being shot, the, the next year they observed also the highest uh, depredation of livestock. And opposite, in a year where they did not hunt wolves, I don't know what was the reason, but they did, did not hunt them, they observed that the following year even a small decline in livestock predation. And that 
the culling itself uh, is not really solving the problem is in line with many other studies from uh, the United States or also from other places in Europe. Uh, often we think that culling seems like a very easy solution, but culling is often really very ineffective, especially when it is surrounded by hunting free areas. And that is often the case when you think about a European context where the species is strictly protected and hunting in general is prohibited. So it often does not solve the conflict and it can even lead to a uh, higher conflict as several uh, uh, studies shows with actually so increasing the livestock depredation. And when you think about, uh, okay, the, and of course it, uh, it is really uh, quickly in conflict with European, existing European legislation. And if you think from the wolf points of view, so if you think about protecting the species, although hunting has all kind of undesired, undesired effects on, uh, on the species itself, it disrupts the social structure uh, which has an effect that it often downgrades the functional role of the wolves very much. So if you remove a few pack members, often the pack is not operating uh, correctly as a pack anymore, so it can exert much smaller impacts on uh, natural uh, uh, wild herbivores. You often increase the amount of dis dispersing individuals, which are more likely to be involved in livestock predation. You reduce the genetic diversity and increase the chance of uh, hybridization with, uh, with dogs. So many reasons uh, that culling also for the species itself is really uh, not a nice option. And of course, shooting wolves and culling wolves does work as, uh, as the past shows, but it is only efficient when you are able to completely exterminate wolves or when you are able to remove the majority of wolves over really large areas. But at the moment when you start removing them in some places, then it becomes a very ineffective uh, tool. So protection and compensation is another management tool. And this is pretty much the default uh, management that we have in, uh, in Europe, in most European countries. It is aimed at strict protection of the species, trying to prevent the damage. And if damage occurs, you compensate the farmers, hunters for uh, the animals that they lost. Of course, this is very beneficial for the wolves itself. It can expand freely and also it maximizes their ecosystem impacts. It is nicely in accordance with European legislation. Uh, but very essential is that you are able to protect your livestock in an effective way. And when it comes to conflicts, uh, this, this management does not really prevent that wolf numbers will keep on increasing and also will keep on increasing in human dominated landscapes. So it may actually not uh, lead to an a reduction of the conflict in the coming years or coming decades. And when it comes to livestock protection, I will not go into details, but you have actually a lot of knowledge available. There's beautiful uh, scientifically based uh, manuals that really give good guidelines about what methods work. Uh, you have these, uh, these guidelines from South Africa where they're dealing with several types of large carnivores from the US, especially aimed at wolves and coyotes. Also, uh, these manuals uh, are already prepared for different European countries. And also for Poland, we have this beautiful Poratnik uh, written by Sabine Novak and Robert Mislajek about how to protect your livestock. And there's definitely effective ways to, to do that. Fencing as a management tool that we, uh, that we discussed, uh, that might for us uh, Europeans maybe be in, uh, a bit of a strange uh, option to think about, but in Australia, New Zealand and South Africa, this is really a very common tool to separate humans from large carnivores and in this way solve uh, conflicts. And when it comes to, um, uh, to fencing, there's actually two options. First of all, you can fence in, which means that you create a large area, uh, think about a national park with a fence around it, and you make sure that the population of wolves can live inside. You can also do the opposite, fencing out. So uh, protect your areas, for example, with livestock where conflicts occur and keep the wolf out of these areas. Well, if you think about fencing in large carnivores, uh, that's a very common uh, uh, management tool, especially in South African national parks. It definitely has benefits. It is very effective in reducing carnivore conflicts. Uh, it's actually, you reduce it to zero because your carnivores are really owned inside the national parks. It can also actually be beneficial for the carnivore itself because you exclude in this way uh, negative human impacts. So for some species like lions, for example, this seems to be really an, a tool that, uh, that works. But there's also definitely downsides to it, nicely reviewed by Matt Hayward and Graham Curley. Uh, there's an all kind of undesirable ecological impact. It leads to fragmented populations, it leads to limited gene flow, it leads also to impact on other wildlife, 
So you don't lock up only your large carnivore, you lock up uh, many much more species. So if you think about fencing in as a in, uh, way forward in Europe, that's quite difficult. If you try to place this in a European context, where we mainly aim at getting things better connected, think about uh, green bridges that, we, that we're making everywhere, thinking about the ecological corridors that we try to establish, then fencing on a large scale is not really the, the way forward. But fencing out, so keeping the large carnivores out of the areas where conflict occur, seems to be a very effective method. There's clear guidelines about minimum uh, requirements of these fences. So you need to, it needs to have a minimum height, it needs to have a minimum amount of electric wires. But if you properly construct these fences and also maintain them properly, it is really a very uh, a proven, very effective way of keeping carnivores outside uh, areas. And if you think about uh, how European landscapes look, look like where at the moment wolves are uh, living, for example, in the Lausitz region, you have often very highly fragmented landscapes and probably in these kind of landscape fences, electric fences might be really a, a way forward to protect hotspots often in the landscape where, uh, where livestock occurs and where you simply do not want to have uh, wolves. Well, this one, uh, in my is the most interesting one, uh, managing behavior of wolves and humans. Uh, what actually we would like to do with this management tool is to create a fine scale separation so that both wolves and humans are avoiding each other by managing their behavior. If you make sure that they are avoiding each other, you, you're really effective in preventing conflicts. But how to do that? Uh, what you actually would like to do is to discourage that the wolves are present in a certain area. And there's all kinds of ways to create, to, to, uh, to, to do aversive conditioning. So the idea is that you create a very negative association with human presence or with livestock presence. And you hope that this leads to a long lasting avoidance so that the wolf is really learning this is not a nice place to be. But the big question of course is can we, just like we teach our dogs not to do something, can we do that with a wolf as well? Well, there's a very nice example of a study uh, uh, in, in, from Wisconsin, USA, where they used uh, shock collars. And I don't want to promote the use of shock collars, but uh, anyway, I, I show it because it, uh, this study uh, is a very interesting one because it illustrates something. What they did is they caught wolves, they gave them a collar, and they also gave them a shock collar, which they also use in domestic dogs. And the idea is once the wolf shows up in an area where you do not want to have it, it receives a small shock. So you create a negative association. And this method actually was very eff effective in preventing the wolves from being in a certain location where livestock was present or when a car where a carcass was present. And even in a period after uh, they stopped uh, receiving these shocks up to 40 days afterwards, the wolves still remember that this was not a nice place to be. So it really looks like this aversive technique of this aversive conditioning works and you can teach a wolf to, be, to stay away from a certain location. And even more interestingly, uh, shown here by the graph here on the bottom, they caught only one member of the pack of the wolves and they taught uh, this particular wolf this behavior, but the other, but the other pack members reacted uh, almost just as strongly. So by teaching one wolf something, you directly teach the whole pack something. So this indicates that actually these kind of uh, techniques uh, definitely have uh, merit and they really can be, uh, could be applied. But well, there's actually a range of uh, different methods that have been, uh, have been used to create these aversive con conditioning. I will not go too much in details, but uh, for example, there's a lot of used chemicals uh, that they put on carcasses of sheep to teach the wolf that a sheep is not a nice thing to eat because these chemicals, they induce vomiting or uh, they create a very bad taste. A lot of experiments have been done with uh, this uh, component, lithium chloride. And there's also all kind of uh, devices that are available, especially on the North American market, uh, that create disruptive stimuli, uh, very high, high, very loud sounds, very bright light reflections or bad smells that are aimed at uh, discouraging wolves or coyotes to be in a certain place. And actually often these, all these devices and all these, uh, these methods, they create often very strong immediate responses and coyotes and wolves are really reacting to it. But the, but the big question is whether these things really work on the long term. Uh, and in a nice review paper from uh, Smith, he showed actually that sometimes these methods work very effectively, sometimes they don't work. 
But I think what we should keep in mind is that there's also, in general, very poor testing. Uh, these uh, devices are being used. Uh, there's there's uh, quite some practical knowledge. But when it comes to really proper testing, if these methods really work, and especially if they work on the long term, that still needs to be uh, uh, done. So that's missing. But I think anyway, uh, the, I think we all agree that the wolf is a very smart animal. And uh, the, the, the study from uh, with the shock collars in Wisconsin definitely showed that you can teach this species something and you can really create an, a negative association for the species to be in certain locations. So I think these kind of techniques have much more pot potential than uh, we're using at the moment. And I just briefly want to mention also these kind of things, repellents, uh, which is a little bit something different, uh, like bear flares, marine flares, pepper spray, or rubber bullets. These are actually very common tools that they use in areas where bears occur, and they are mainly aimed at uh, preventing direct encounters, so more as protective uh, measurements. The moment when a bear is too close by, uh, they use these, uh, these things to, uh, to, uh, to, to, prevent, to prevent attacks. And it could potentially, they could also be used for aversive conditioning techniques, but there's actually, uh, I'm not aware of any studies that show that these uh, techniques really, really work uh, for, for long term to create avoidance of humans, for example. Actually, in a very interesting thing that we often uh, forget is that we as humans are still the biggest fear factor for most large carnivores. And there's now a number of publications from a, a nice uh, Canadian uh, research group that use these techniques, they use camera traps in combination with uh, sound devices. And what they did is uh, they simply broadcasted uh, the sound of different uh, animal species and also of humans, and they checked the reaction of the large carnivore. And this is an example connected to pumas. They showed that the moment uh, the puma hears humans, more than 90% of the pumas left their kill site. So these the sound of a human really creates a very strong behavioral response in large carnivores. They showed it for puma, but they also showed it for many other species. And this does not mean that you need to shout or make a lot of sound. It is just enough if people are, are softly speaking. So that's often, I think, what we forget. And I think this has a lot of potential, potentially, for using it also in, uh, in wolf management to create uh, behavioral responses in wolves. Well, actually crucial for all the management options that I have discussed is that you need to make sure that you have abundant wild prey. There's many studies that show that if you have uh, abundant wild prey availability, it reduces very much the chance of uh, livestock depredation. And very illustrative is this paper from Sidorovic uh, in, uh, that was an area in Belarus that showed that during a period of declining abundance of wild ungulates because of intensified hunting, they observed a higher of uh, dogs being killed, more cattle being killed, and also a higher incidence of wolves observed inside villages. So it really shows that it is very important, and it's also based on other studies, that you need to have a rich ungulate community that the wolf also has something to choose from. And if you think about Bielogiesia, that we have a lot of species there, but in many areas in uh, Europe, these big ones, like the European bison and moose, are missing. There's also many regions, especially in Germany and the Netherlands, where red deer are actively prevented from settling or actively prevented from being there because they're involved in agricultural conflicts. And the same is actually true for wild boar. So actually in many regions, we have quite an impoverished ungulate community. And I think you should keep it in mind with all the, uh, if you try to solve conflicts, uh, I think this is a starting point. If you do not have a rich uh, wild ungulate community, it will be very hard to prevent any conflicts with, uh, with wolves. Well, finally, uh, we think about teaching the wolf something to stay away from us, but I think we should also not forget to teach humans something. In this nice uh, paper from uh, Pentariani, he reviewed 700 large carnivore attacks that were well documented, and that included puma, but it also included brown bears and uh, wolves. And he showed that in 47% of the cases, human behavior was actually the main factor that triggered the attack. So there's different types of behavior that you should better not do in areas where large carnivores live, like leaving your children unattended or dog presence, especially dogs uh, without a leash, uh, accidents during hunting events or activity at night. And he also mentioned that food conditioning and habituation so that uh, large carnivores are getting used to humans and associate humans with something positive is very much increasing the risk of uh, carnivore attacks. So our behavior is definitely very important, uh, and especially in areas that wolves are now recolonizing, 
and where they have been absent for 100 or sometimes up to 200 years, it is very important to teach the people again how to coexist with, uh, with wolves. And also for wolves, there's definitely some things that we should uh, rather not do in areas where they live. We should simply not approach them. We should definitely not feed them to give them a positive association with humans, try to avoid activities at night, keeping dogs on a leash. But I think we should also not forget to enjoy them, but just keep your distance. And despite the fact that the internet is actually full of these kind of images or uh, movies that suggest that the wolf is a very cuddly animal that you can kiss and that you can hug, uh, maybe in some settings that may work in some kind of uh, zoo settings, but we should not forget that this is a large predator that evolved for thousands of years to hunt big prey. So they are powerful, they have big teeth and they have big claws, so in my eyes they deserve respect and that's what we should keep in our mind. Well, just to summarize the story, uh, scientifically, there's definitely important reasons to be happy with the comeback of wolves. They can definitely exert uh, ecosystem impacts. So scientifically, there's really good reasons to be happy with, uh, with their comeback. But of course, when they show up in human-dominated areas, uh, conflicts quickly occur. Population control is often the first thing that we think about to solve our conflicts. But scientifically, there's really good evidence to show that often it does not solve the conflict and it can actually lead to a much higher conflict when it comes, for example, to livestock predation. And it is also definitely quickly in conf conflict with uh, European legislation. We should explore much better the protective measurements that exist and the methods to protect our livestock. And it depends uh, where you are or on the conditions, what is a proven uh, method of what is an effective method. Maybe in some areas, these guarding dogs may help. In other areas, it may already be a very effective tool simply to put your livestock inside stables or to use electric fences on more fine scale. These effective of these methods have evidence that they are really effective as long as you properly uh, carry them out. Managing behavior of wolves and humans is uh, definitely important. Uh, we should try to really enhance the mutual avoidance. We should keep on teaching the wolf in my eyes to stay away from humans, so to associate humans with something negative and not with food. But we should also not forget to keep on teaching the humans that this is a predator and that we should uh, be respectful for, for it and try to avoid it. And I think all these measurements, uh, they start with uh, making sure that you have a rich wild prey base. If you do not have anything uh, that the wolf can choose from, it will simply go to, uh, to livestock. So make sure that you have uh, this rich base that the wolf can concentrate on wild prey rather than domestic prey. Well, I would like to end with the, with the, with the picture that I showed you at the beginning. Uh, I think uh, if you think about the thousands of years that we have now been living together with large carnivores, we have learned a lot and we should admire be much more clever now and think about different options that are available instead of only uh, killing them to solve our conflicts. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Greece. Really nice presentation.